Okay, I'd like to, um, I'm really excited that Kelly Maria Cruzio uh, is with us today. Um, she's a graduate of 1998 from Fairfield. Um, she was my student, I think she took all my classes. <laughs> there was one she missed. She was also my research student, and she uh, won the Arts and Science Award that year, mm -hmm. uh, the Major Arts and Science Award year, so it was, uh, it was a great year. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, after she left Fairfield, she got a doctor, uh, her doctor, you know, my girl at Georgetown University. Then she proceeded to go to Leiden, 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 Leiden excuse me, Leiden University in the Netherlands, and um, for a postdoctor. And then she continued to postdoc at you know, New York University at Langone Med Medical Center. Um, presently, she's an assistant professor at the Quinnipiac School of Medicine. Um, where she just started in September, mm -hmm. so that's exciting. And she, numerous publications um, in terms of everything she did in basically immunology. Um, I always ask my students for a little piece of interesting information, that uh, something about them, and she's fluent in Dutch. So <laughs> if, if anybody's fluent in Dutch, uh, you could communicate with her. But anyway, we're really excited to have her, and she, her topic's going to be the role of somatic mutations in stem cell transformation. <laughs> Introduction. I'm so happy to be here because I, as Dr. Brown said, I graduated in 1998 and things have changed so much here and so it's <laughs> exciting to be here. And I have very fond memories of Dr. Ross as well. Um, I took cell biology with him and he had such a joy and enthusiasm about teaching that really sat with me. And in particular, I remember um, he mentioned during a cell biology class that physicians are great, but if it wasn't for scientists, physicians wouldn't have any tools to do anything. <laughs> And that really sat with me I, I, a number of times throughout my career. I've dealt with a lot of physicians. <laughs> and um, and yeah, there really is a lot of teamwork involved. And, um, and the, the, the earlier that both sides realize that, the better things we can do. And so what I'm going to be talking about today um, is actually, I feel like, something that really exemplifies that. And it's um, work that I did while I was a postdoc at NYU in Giannis Afonso's lab. And it was a collaborative effort with people um, at Sloan Kettering, particularly Ross Levine. Um, and so, um, but before I start, um, I just, I'll give you, if it work, no, it's not working. Okay. Um, just tell you, I'm gonna briefly review terminology, and I know some of it might be pretty basic, but just so we're all talking about the same things towards the end. Um, I'll talk about um, leukemia in the context of the type of research that I will do. Um, and then my research and some summary and, and time for questions. And if there's anything along the way, please stop me. Um, yeah, I have no problem answering questions along the way. Okay, so what's this? Oh, why is this not working? What's the somatic mutation? Um, does anyone want to hesitate, I guess? Or? Oh. Yeah, I know it's lunchtime. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, a somatic mutation, oh, this is not cooperating. A somatic mutation is actually a mutation that happens after fertilization. And so it can happen in any of the cells um, from the embryo all the way down, individual cells. Um, and the, uh, uh, this is in contrast to um, a germline mutation. Germline mutation is usually um, one of either the egg or the sperm. Um, has a mutation and that is expressed in all of the cells of the embryo and then all of the cells of course in a uh, fully grown organism and half of these gametes and so this type of mutation a germline mutation can be transferred and uh, passed on to um, the progeny while a somatic mutation generally doesn't occur um, or be, is not passed on. Everyone okay with that? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so how about stem cells? You hear a lot about stem cells, but how much do we all really generally know about them and how do scientists actually characterize them? Um, stem cells are really particular um, special cells in that they have a couple of unique characteristics. One is that they have this ability to what we call self-renew, and that is they could stay in a quiescent state for quite a long time, but then they can replicate um, and um, and be able to then, um, that, that replicating cell can be able to differentiate into all the cells in the human, or 
whatever organism we're looking at. Um, so they have the ability to self-renewal and to differentiate. Um, these are very primitive cells. And then typ typically when we're thinking about stem cells, they come in um, two, sort, two flavors. We have our embryonic stem cells, um, and that's what we hear a lot about because they're quite controversial. Um, and we have our adult uh, stem cells. So first, embryonic stem cells, they're derived from the inner cell mass of a blastocyst um, after in vitro fertilization. And these cells grow really easily in culture. Um, you could isolate them, you could throw them on generally um, embryonic fibroblasts, along with a couple of cytokine cocktails and other nutrients, and they're really happy. And they grow so quickly that you really don't want to culture these in tissue culture because you have to change them almost and split them almost every day. Um, and so this is what some of the ES um, cell colonies look like. And the really neat and cool things and why they're such an exciting topic right now is that these ES cells, um, under the certain conditions, we can make them become any cell we want to be. Neurons, macrophages, smooth muscle, um, and that's um, really a lot of research is going on right now to try to determine what types of tissue culture um, conditions can kind of drive these different uh, pathways. And can we do it um, in other types of cells, not just these very primordial e ES cells? The other type of cell, um, stem cells that we don't hear that much about um, are adult stem cells, or also known as somatic stem cells. And these stem cells are like embryonic stem cells in that they can self-renew and differentiate, but they're unique in that they reside in um, certain organs of an, uh, a fully grown organism, in this case a human. Um, and they're thought that they can only really differentiate and um, reproduce the entire organ in which they reside. So um, we've known about these for some time, but it's only recently that we've really discovered that they're actually not as rare as we initially thought. And then we've seen these types of uh, adult stem cells not only in places where we expected them, in, in the gut um, and also um, the bone marrow, but we also can find them in the brain as well as skeletal muscle and heart muscles. Okay. So a type of adult um, stem cell that we um, that we we've known about for quite some time actually, and it's really the the um, been well characterized are hematopoietic stem cells, and these stem cells are the stem cells that generate all of our blood, and typically you see um, the blood um, in hematopoiesis uh, being depicted in this way with your stem cell, um, your adult stem cell at the top, um, and then it differentiating into these different um, progeny. Uh, and every time you see a lineage breakpoint, these cells are then restricted to that group. So these cells can replicate and, and differentiate into this group, but the cells from these common lymphoid progenitors or clips can't can't do any of these myeloid arms. And so generally you'll see these somatopoietic stem cells at the top and then the multipotent progenitors and then a split into your myeloid population and your lymphoid population. Once these cells are terminally differentiated, um, you, with other types of organ systems, they don't replicate. But again, with immune cells, you'll see that there is some type of replication going on here at this level, but they can't go backwards. Um, so. What is controlling this and where do these cells reside? Your hematopoietic stem cells reside in what we call a stem cell niche and that is in the long bones of your bone marrow. And it's a really um, highly dynamic environment. It's a microenvironment composed of cells and also molecular factors. And these um, cells are really important um, in instructing the, uh, the hematopoietic stem cells to undergo um, various fate, cell fate decisions. So how does this work? So you can imagine you have osteoclasts and, um, your, and those are your um, cells that are in your, located in your bone and you have your hematopoietic stem cells. And what um, these osteoclasts that are in blast um, actually do is they signal using molecular um, signaling proteins um, down into the, um, the hematopoietic stem cell and they'll tell the cell they very during varying singling transduction pathways to differentiate or to remain quiescent, and that means to not replicate, to stay quiet, right? 
So it's a highly dynamic process, but it's also one that needs to be very tightly controlled. So just to kind of take a step back again, stem cells are cells with the ability to self-renew and differentiate. Hematopoietic stem cells are adult stem cells capable of generating all the cell lineages in the blood. Um, and these HSCs reside in the bone marrow, bone marrow where they see, receive extrinsic, extrinsic as well as intrinsic signals um, that direct the cell to either self-renew, di differentiate, or remain quiescent. So does anyone have any questions yet? Okay, so I'm going to change gears right now and talk a little bit about leukemia or also what happens when things don't go so well in that tightly regulated hematopoiesis. Um, leukemia was first coined by Rudolf uh, Virchow in 1847. And what he noticed is in patients presenting with similar, pop, uh, similar symptoms, um, fatigue, night sweats, fever sometimes, um, when he, when you, uh, he looked at the blood, he saw a large white population. Um, and so he called this leukemia, with, for the Greek, leukos meaning white, and hemia meaning blood. Um, if you take peripheral blood from a patient and you spin it down on a sucrose gradient, um, you could see that um, the blood different uh, settles. And you have plasma. Um, and erythrocytes making up the majority of it, but you have this very tiny layer called the puffy coat, and that's where your white blood cells are. Now, in a, it's very small generally, but in leukemia patients, you can see this is a huge number of white blood cells. And so, Virchow was seeing this um, and, and, and describing it, and that's how he got the name leukemia. We now know to, that is a malignant, progressive disease of precursor cells, and they often, and they occupy the bone marrow and often circulate in the bloodstream as well. And that's why we can see it on here. Okay. So leukemia is in a pretty important disease. It, um, it's still ranked number 10 in the um, number of incidences of um, cancer in both sexes. Um, so it's still very relevant. It's still a disease that we really, even though we know quite a lot about leukemias, um, we're still struggling to try to get all the answers for and, and to help patients. In general, leukemia has been um, separated based on the types of cells and the morphology, and traditionally we knew that by looking at the cells under a microscope, and also how the patients presented. So we'd have lymphoid leukemias, and these are your T and B cell types of leukemias, right? and, um, and your myeloid leukemias. And so that's those two arms that I was showing you, and we'll get back to that in a second. Um, and then we have what's called acute or chronic. So acute, um, types of leukemias, these patients have rapid onset with severe symptoms, they're not feeling well from one day to the next, they're feeling very unwell, almost like they come in sick with an infection. And often you have to rule that out when these patients present. Um, and then you have these chronic types of leukemias where the patients are doing all right, they're a little fatigued, they're a little tired, um, and some types of leukemias you don't even uh, notice unless you have a routine uh, blood exam and that's where you see this larger proliferation of white blood cells. Okay, so I'm going to keep it pretty basic in, in that um, we have basically these two groups and what I'm going to be focusing on my talk for the rest of the talk is the myeloid arm or the myeloid types of leukemias. And so this is particularly having to do with the types of leukemias that we find on this side of the um, of the lineage tree, and um, these types of cells give rise to your neutrophils, your monocytes, these, um, as well as your macrophages and your dendritic cells. Most of the time, um, you look at patients with myeloid leukemias, and this is a normal peripheral blood smear. Does anyone know what, I, what I'm saying, peripheral blood smear, what I mean? No. So, so when you take blood um, from a patient, you could just drop it on the end of the slide, just or even from your finger, um, and then you can slide it across the slide, and then you could see what type of cells are there in your, in your peripheral blood. And generally, when you look at a, um, a healthy individual, you see a whole lot of red blood cells. And then you also see these little tiny ones. Um, these are your platelets. Um, and then you see some of these. Often you don't really see that this this many, um, but these are neutrophils, and these are the myeloid cells that you see the most in a normal, healthy individual. 
But a patient with um, a myeloid type of malignancy, this, you have a greatly increased number in these type of myeloid cells. Um, and so this is already a clue as to something's not quite right. It could be infection um, or it could be a cancer. So once you rule out all of your infection um, types of uh, possibilities, a lot of times we go and then take a bone marrow biopsy. And in typical, in a normal patient, a bone marrow biopsy will look something like this. Um, a lot of open circles here that looks like air. These are actually um, adipose cells or adipocytes. Um, and, um, and you see a lot of little, tiny little cells as well as stromal cells, and this is bone. But when you have a patient with myeloproliferative or a myeloid type of leukemia, where did all of your fat cells go? They're gone, right? They're rapidly proliferating cells. They call them sheaths of cells. And so these cells are out of control. They're taking up all this other space. So what do you think um, these types of patients present with? Do you think they have a ton of red blood cells too? They have a ton of white blood cells. Do you think they have a ton of red blood cells? No? Yeah. Right, you're right. These patients often complain of being tired and fatigued. They have anemia because there's no place for these cells to be made. It's completely being taken over by, um, by your myeloid cells and you're actually blocking the different, often you're blocking the differentiation of these erythroid cells as well. Um, additionally, these patients, because these hematopoietic stem cells then also leave this compartment, um, They'll also have a complaint of early sati, which means they get, um, they're filled up really quickly when they're eating, even though they didn't eat much. Um, and that's because these cells leave this compartment, they'll go to the spleen, and they'll actually start undergoing hematopoiesis there in the spleen. And so you have, your spleen gets greatly enlarged, and it pushes on your stomach. And so these um, patients often are not really hungry either. Okay. So, Quite some time, so within the myeloid malignancies, we have something called chronic myeloid leukemia. So chronic, these patients aren't acutely ill, but um, they do have an increase in myeloid cells um, in their blood marrow. And so there was some really eloquent work done by Peter Noel and David Hungerford in 1960 um, in both UPenn and the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, and they identified something that's called the Philadelphia chromosome. Have you guys ever heard of the Philadelphia chromosome? Okay, so for a while people were trying to find, um, you know, what causes leukemia. They were looking for some type of chromosomal aberration, they couldn't find it. And these two were the first to really identify um, something was um, deleted on uh, chromosome uh, 22. And it wasn't until Janet Raleigh um, in 1973 actually identified that it was a translocation between 22 and 9 that gave us this smaller Philadelphia chromosome. And then subsequent work showed that this um, Philadelphia chromosome actually makes this mutant protein um, called BCR able, and it's a tyrosine kinase. So if you think back to this very complicated um, signaling transduction pathway um, within the cell, and within your hematopoietic stem cell, all of these tightly controlled things um, and signaling pathways are uh, regulated by tyrosine ty kinases. So now we have this hyperactive mutant uh, tyrosine kinase that's um, going in, binding all these other factors, and causing these cells to rapidly proliferate and rapidly self-renew. So even the stem cells are dividing rapidly, right? And they've stopped being quiescent. And so this was a real breakthrough for um, chronic myeloid leukemia. And um, people really um, were trying to go after this enzyme, and it was because, because it was an enzyme hoping that it would be easy to target. And what happened was they eventually developed tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, that are particular um, to BCR able. And what you could see is that in the years, and this is um, currently available as Gleevec or imatinib, um, since the advent of these um, drugs, you could see that the survival, or eight-year survival, uh, in patients who were diagnosed with CML had gone from something like 15% prior to 1983 to um, 
greater than um, 95%. Um, currently. I mean, right now, CML used to be a death sentence, and now it's a treatable type of leukemia. Um, you see this increase here. This is because people started to use um, bone marrow transplant, transplants, and they were somewhat successful in doing so. The problem is with bone marrow transplants is that it's a very aggressive form of treatment, so you have to um, radiate these patients until you um, destroyed all of their bone marrow, um, hope they survive all of that and then um, have a, a donor that can give you a bone marrow to replace it, and then also hope that they could survive the, the process of them repopulating um, the whole system. So it was an improvement to nothing, um, but certainly if we have a drug that these patients can take and that really goes after the uh, particular mutant clone, then the, the chance of survival is much better, and these patients actually tolerate this drug very well. Mm -hmm. Mm. Not, not that I'm aware of. Um, that's a good question, though. Yeah. I don't know how long. <coughs> yeah, there is some. Es I do. I do know there is some es escape from this, and they have. Um, they have modified, and they do have second line. So probably they do have to take it. I'm, I'm not quite sure how long they take it. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. Generally, myeloid malignancies, and I'm being very general here, because um, there are, it's not across the board, but in general, we see uh, myeloid malignancies tend to be um, malignancies that we see in older populations, so 60, 60 plusers. Um, and so what we also know about them is that the, the myeloid malignancies tend to be um, an increase of um, our early precursors, like I was saying, um, your myeloid precursors or even your hematopoietic stem cells. And for a long time, um, when I started this project, we felt like the, the types of mutations that you did see, as myeloid malignancies, I wanna say again, I'll go back, um, they are actually um, pretty heterogeneous. So you can have acute forms, um, and you can have these very slow-going um, proliferative neoplasms that take years, um, and, and so, most people felt like the, the, the types of uh, leukemias within the myeloid compartment fell into two classes. One, um, genes that activate signaling, like we were talking about, like the BCR able, um, and other class of genes that block these differentiation of these cells. So these are looking at like transcription factors that turn on certain differentiation programs to, to make this early progenitor cell turn into a neutrophil. So that was kind of the working theory. But the problem is that the, the types, the heterogeneity in the disease, not in just um, in how the, not just in how the cells look, suggests that at the molecular level, these diseases are actually much more compli complicated and much more heterogeneous than just being a myeloid neoplasm or a myeloid um, leukemia, um, either in an acute form or a chronic form. And so there's been a lot of work trying to do um, and re repeat what um, was done in the 60s and 70s of looking at these genes, not just at a chromosomal level, but at a molecular level in fine detail now, um, and trying to find out additional mutations that are important to um, the promotion of leukemia. And so that was part of what I was studying at NYU. And at the same time, I was working on this project, several groups, a group in France, as well as a group in Netherlands, published um, work that demonstrated looking at patients with myeloid neo neoplasms and malignancy, other types of malignancies, they found a deletion that was on chromosome uh, 4 Q24. And the only gene that was identified in that region um, was a gene called TET2. And so what they found, um, as, uh, and, uh, and our collaborators at Sloan Kettering um, also found several mutations um, within this gene, and they weren't just across the board uh, loss of um, both alleles. A lot of these, the mutations they found um, were heterozygous. So you could find only one allele was mutated in either stopping the um, transcript or adding a nonsense um, uh, coding, codon or um, a missense codon. In, 
What they also discovered was that a lot of the patients who had these type of mutations, in particular AML, had a poor prognosis. So if, even if they had a heterozygous mutation, they tend to have an overall um, lower survival um, than, than patients who um, were wild type for TET2. So what are these TET2 program, uh, proteins? And I was st actually um, started in the lab, no one was quite sure. They had the name TET2 because of um, a, a predecessor, someone had found that um, an earlier protein, which they called TET1, um, was actually a, a translocation between 10 and 11 in um, MLL, so also another type of leukemia, but no one had characterized what these proteins do. Um, and it was until I had started the project that we started to have some other papers come out from um, collaborators in the group that started to describe what these TET program proteins do. And, and now we know a lot more about them, but we're still unclear as to what their function is um, in terms of um, hematopoiesis. But I'll tell you a little bit, they all the TET proteins, they're a family of three, they have this CX, uh, CXXC domain, um, which binds methylated um, cytosine, except for TET2, which binds a protein that has this domain. Um, and then they have this catalytic domain that's cysteine rich and then has this double stranded um, binding uh, uh, homodimer, I forgot um, is the name. And what they do here, this, this um, enzymatic domain or catalytic domain is important to bind iron and it's important for the um, function of the enzyme. And what it's believed to do is that the TET proteins actually recognize 5 methylcytosine. Um, and is anyone familiar with what methylcytosine on DNA? Does anyone? I heard somebody. What? Go ahead. Does it um, decondense? Yeah. So it generally methylcytosine, right, um, is on large uh, CPG islands, right, and so often we'll see. Um, these, these types of marks on the DNA modulating transcription, right? And so what the, we believe the TET proteins are doing here is actually hydroxylating um, this 5-methylcytosine to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. Uh, and so this is actually the first step in demethylating um, the 5-methylcytosine. But we weren't sure if whether or not um, the mutations that we saw in these patients were really relevant or significant or were these bystander mutations. Um, and so we wanted to know what the consequences of a TET2 loss in the hematopoietic compartment um, was. And does it affect um, hematopoiesis? So what uh, um, we first did was actually uh, look at the expression of TET2 in the hematopoietic compartment. And we saw that it is expressed. We did real-time RT-PCR, and we looked at these different populations, our HSCs, which are represented by LSKs, um, and these other early uh, progenitor um, cells, as well as some um, dif com um, differentiated cells here that are represented by the um, marker that we use to find them. As well as in the thymus and the spleen, uh, we do see TET2 expression, so it's pretty ubiquitously expressed. Next, what we did just in vitro to try to get a feeling for whether or not um, TET2 had an effect, um, the loss of TET2 had an effect in the hematopoietic stem cells, is um, we did a knockdown. So we used shRNA against TET2, and then um, we looked at two things. We looked at whether or not we had a um, decrease in the 5-HMC, right? So the activity of TET2 should, um, should create 5-HMC, if we knock it down, it should go down. And what we did, we saw, was that indeed the 5-HMC levels did go down. We looked at this via mass spec. Um, what we also did was something called a, um, a colony-forming assay. And a colony-forming assay is where you take um, early progenitor cells, or um, bone marrow cells, that have a lot of hematopoietic stem cells, and you plate them into media that is, promotes differentiation. You let them sit for a week or two, um, and they form little colonies with different heterogeneous populations of T cells and B cells, um, as well as myeloid cells. And then you, um, you trypsinize them, and you replate them. 
Now in a normal cell, or a normal uh, hematopoietic stem cells from the bone marrow, you could replete twice, maybe three times, before all of their cells have completely terminally differentiated and you lost all your stem cells. But what we saw in TEP2 knockouts was that we could continuously replate these cells. And that was really striking because suddenly now these cells had um, gained something that looked an awful lot like increased self renewal, at least in vitro. And these, um, we plated here out to five times, so um, that's 20 weeks, but we kept them in culture um, and they stayed in culture for a year, completely happy before we froze them down. So, suggesting these cells weren't your average, um, average stem cell, which would generally in such conditions differentiate and then eventually die. Um, what we also noticed is that we took these cells, and you'll see them in a little bit more detail, and just in the knockdown and looked at markers for stem cells, you'd see in our repopulated cell we had an increase of um, our knockdown for TET2, we saw an increase in stem cell markers. Um, so just having this prolifer um, primary in vitro data, uh, we decided to go ahead and uh, generate a mouse that was deficient for TET2. Um, and so, you know, it's, there's always a question of how you should design this mouse to make sure it actually um, has the phenotype that recapitulates what you see in a patient. And so we spent a long time reanalyzing all of the data that we have had so far with different mutations in the different patients and decided to just go ahead and take out um, exon 3. The first two exons in TET2 aren't coded, uh, don't create any protein. So we decided the first coding exon, exon 3, if we deleted that and shifted everything else out of frame, we would, um, since we have so many um, mutations already in exon 3, we'd be able to destroy its function completely. So I generated mice that um, were able to, that flocked exon 3 and set the rest of the um, protein, our transcript, out of frame. And then we looked at expression in these mice uh, for TET2 as well as the other TET family members. And what, as we expected, we saw no expression and transcript of TET2 um, in both the bone marrow, uh, thymus, and spleen. As well as we didn't see, we continued to see expression of TET1 and 3, and there didn't seem to be any compensatory increase in transcript or something that you might expect if one could compensate for the other. Then we took the bone marrow cells from these mice that were deficient in TET2 now, and we did the same um, colony forming assays. And again, compared to wild type, we plated it only a couple of times. Compared to the mice that were deficient in TET2, we could plate them on endless, uh, on, on ending, on endlessly. <laughs> um, and what we could do was also, when you look at this second plating, right, you already see this a much more heterogeneous population. But as we continued plating these deficient TET2 mice, these are wild type, um, but these are the deficient ones you already see that these cells are much more homogeneous. Um, and as you continue in time, they also morphologically start to look more like um, our early progenitor, progenitor cells that we often see hyperproliferative in myeloid malignancy. Can I just ask sure. Did you look at heterozygotes? Did you see yeah, any? Yeah, I'll get to oh, that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We did another, so, so this is all in vitro, right? So these cells, we're, we take them out of the mouse, but then we plate them in vitro and hope that they, you know, see how they do. But there's cytokines involved, there's a lot of other things that go. So what we wanted to do was say, oh, these cells look like they have increased self-renewal in vitro. Let's look in vivo, is that the case? So what we do, and it, uh, we have this pretty, I think, neat system of you have mice, <laughs> and mice um, are, these mice are genetically completely identical, except for um, two things. One has your uh, conditional knockout um, now for TET2. So it's wild type, but it needs to be, um, the, the knockout needs to be uh, induced by injection. We inject with uh, interferon, and that'll cause um, the, the, the genome to be deleted and then your, your, pro your protein not to be expressed. The other difference between these two mice um, is that one has a slightly different marker than the other, and we could follow these markers by facts. Um, so what we do is first we um, take the bone marrow from these mice, and then we lethally irradiate a separate mouse um, that has uh, that we could also follow in time um, because it has a slightly different marker, and then we inject 
50% of our inducible allele and 50% of a wild type um, tattoo allele. And we allow them to engraft. So basically we do a bone marrow transplant in mice, giving them two types of bone marrow, one healthy bone marrow and one that is the potential to be deleted for tattoo. It's not deleted yet, so technically they're both healthy bone marrow. And there's a reason why we do this. There's a lot of arguments in the immunology mouse world about, well, if you've already deleted this allele and then you inject it in the mouse, maybe it just doesn't engraft very well. Maybe the differences you're seeing are already, uh, not because it's not um, working, but because they just didn't engraft. So we first allow these to engraft 50-50, and that's what we see here. You have a chimerism of about 50-50, and we could bleed these mice on a weekly basis to look at these two specific markers, CD45.1 and 45.2, and see then we inject, and that's when we delete our um, tattoo allele, and we follow these cells over time by looking at the peripheral blood. So what we're asking is how good, once, we, once they engraft and we know they're in there at 50%, how good is our tet two knockout at, um, at proliferating, at self-renewing, at generating uh, and doing all the things we expect a, a, um, a hematopoietic stem cell doing. And is it better than wild type? And what we could see is when you have wild type versus wild type, and, and there's a lot of mice here, so that, <laughs> um, that's why you see such a big uh, difference. But um, in general, they stay about 50-50. But when you delete the tattoo allele, suddenly the tattoo allele does just what we saw in vitro. It increases its self-renewal activity and can outcompete the wild type of allele. When you get out to um, 23 weeks, we are looking at these mice bleeding once a week, the only cells in these mice were the, from the tattoo um, knockout. So yes, these cells look like they have increased self-renewal and are hyperproliferative. Okay, so this can get confusing because there's lots of facts plots. What I want you to pay attention is to, um, based on what we just showed, it looks like the uh, HSCs, the hematopoietic stem cells in these mice, are, can self-renew and are, um, have an advantage. But what does this look like um, in the cellular level? Do they have more HSCs? And so um, they do. They have more of these HSC um, stem and progenitor cells. Um, and it, they don't have a lot of these early, early stem cells. They have the same amount as wild type, but what they particularly have is an increase in the myeloid compartment of, and so we measure that by looking at markers specifically for all those cell types, and, and then measuring them out here, and then counting back the number of cells that we have from the mouse originally. Additionally, and remember I said before, patients with myeloid malignancies tend to have these large spleens because the HSCs and all that, they leave the bone marrow, they go into the spleen and they start undergoing hematopoiesis there. And we see a similar thing with these mice. These mice all of a sudden have um, increased LSKs, or these are these stem and progenitor cells in their spleen, and they're not supposed to be, they're not in high frequency. And in particular, they have a lot of myeloid cells here. Um, and these can be quantified again um, by looking at total cell numbers. I think important to point out here is that we didn't see this right away, and I've done a lot of different type of mouse mutants and things like that, and some really spectacular things you see almost immediately. And we had to wait 20 weeks. I mean, at this point, we were very sad. It was four to six weeks. We had these mice, they were deleted for tattoo, and they were completely happy. Um, and we really had to go and bleed these mice on a regular basis, and we had to get out to 20 weeks before we started to see these types of differences. But if you think back to your patients, this is a type of disease that we often see in young people really early on. No, we often see these in old people. And so, um, and there's more recent data that suggests that this is really, you see increases in TET2 mutations in older populations and in older people, and it kind of starts this clonal expansion of a certain type of population. And so, that's why you often see these myeloid malignancies, we think, um, in a later stage. So do these mice get myeloid malignancies or neoplasias? And they do. Um, again, here's our spleens. They're significantly bigger just by looking at them, but we can weigh them and they're also much bigger. Um, they have an increase of white blood cells. These white blood cells are of the myeloid lineage. And if you look at the peripheral blood of mice, which should look pretty much like peripheral blood in humans, um, 
this is the wild type, this is the control. Again, you see a lot of myeloid cells. Um, and if you look at their bone marrow, it's hyperproliferative compared to wild type. The spleen has lost its architecture. That's because we have a lot of HSCs and, and LSKs in there going and undergoing hematopoiesis. But we also have METs. We have METs in the liver and METs in the lung. And if you go back and look at the spleen and look at what kind of cells are growing in here, you see also a large population of myeloid cells that's quantified here. So do the hats get sick? And they do. So um, the hats actually do everything um, the, uh, the homozygous do. And so they replate better. Um, they tend to look, this is a bad picture actually, I'm looking at it, but they tend to look like myeloid cells. They outcompete in vivo. Um, they have an increase in white blood cells that are particularly myeloid. Um, and they also have large spleens um, at 20 weeks. So, how am I doing? So, in summary, the loss of TET2 in the hematopoietic compartment leads to increase of self renewal of HSCs, and this leads to progressive myeloid proliferation and eventually myeloid malignancies or neoplasia. The TET2 haplo insufficiency, so those are our heterozygous, um, have increased self renewal, um, suggesting it's sufficient to contribute to myeloid transformation in, in vivo, like we see in patients. And this was the first publication that shows TET2. Te this work that we did um, shows that TET2 is a master regulator of both normal and malignant hematopoiesis. Um, and this paper, in combination with um, a couple of other um, patient analysis, really suggested that um, TET2 is part of a new class of epigenetic modifiers. So they don't fit into our stimulant transduction pathway, they don't fit into our transcription factor mutation pathway. But actually, the regulation of methyl methylation or epigenetics is an entire class of its own. And this is, was the first member of those types of mutations, and we've since found a couple of others. And so, what to do next, right? Um, there's a lot to do next, and we don't really even know what TET2 is doing specifically by hydromethylating um, these cytosines. And how does that contribute to um, hematopoiesis, even normally, let alone in a malignant hematopoiesis? Um, how are TET2 proteins themselves regulated? This should be an easy um, analysis, but it just hasn't been done yet. Um, and are there other therapies that can modulate hydroxymethylation? And would they be beneficial? Just like I talked about um, interfering or inhibiting um, the tyrosine kinase that was mutated in CML, is there a potential to target hydroxymethylation and would that be beneficial to patients who have these types of mutations? And then again, we don't know how TET2 plays um, in context of other mutations. There's a lot of work going on uh, at Smoke Kettering and with our old collaborators who are actually crossing these mice with other known mutations that are also seen in these types of diseases and seeing if they could speed things up, and they do. And so there's a lot of work. We, there was one, just a paper, I want to say last year, um, in New England Journal of Medicine that was mentioning, like I said before, that TET2 loss really kind of starts to steer um, in patients, starts to steer these patients who are otherwise healthy and have no symptoms of TET2 loss <coughs> to have more of a clonal proliferation of their myeloid cells. They're not sick, there's not a lot of cells, um, they don't have huge numbers of white counts, but they do have this TET2 loss and if you follow them over time they accumulate other mutations and they tend to, um, and they tend to develop um, myeloid malignancies. And the patients who don't uh, accumulate other uh, mutations often don't develop myeloid mutations, so, uh, myeloid malignancy. So it's not an all or nothing. And we're still analyzing some of these mice. We've done some work to look at other mutations that are happening in these mice, but I didn't present all of that data here today. So, um, so I want to say thank you to, um, to some of my collaborators and, and friends from the lab that I did this work with. Lindsay is a graduate student and a great friend who, um, who did all this work with me when I was a postdoc. Um, and Delphine and Camille um, is a technician and another postdoc in the lab who uh, really did a lot of the mouse analysis, uh, taking care of the mice really when they got sick. And um, Giannis is my boss, um, was at NYU, and then Ross Levine at um, the Levine Lab, as well as Omar and Alan were collaborators on this project, as well as co-authors on the work. Um, I think. 
That's it. Oh, I wanted to say, um, just being here at Fairfield and, 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 and thinking about teaching, and I just wanted to say that Dr. Braun, I have to tell you, everybody has their, their teacher that like made a difference in their life, and that might be kindergarten or high school, but for me it was Dr. Braun, and I'm here today because of her, so thank you. So you have any questions? Yeah, any questions? If you want to talk about other things too besides like science, I, I heard that if there's interest in med school or grad school, I'd be happy to answer that too. I thought it was so exciting to see the, the tyrosine kinase effect on leukemia. Yeah. I thought that was pretty you know, impressive. But yeah. I'm wondering about the side effects for someone taking something that inhibits tyrosine kinases. That's not the only tyrosine kinase a, a person needs. So right. I'm wondering when you're talking about future therapies for you know thinking about you know affecting methylation of DNA, you also have as a huge spectrum issue to consider. Right. So, I'm just curious, you know, if paralleling it with what, what's known about how tyrosine kinase inhibitors work yeah, and the body and side effects of that. Yeah, it's a good point. But the um, So the matinib and, and those tyrosine kinases are pretty specific for that mutation. Um, and so um, so they're very, fairly well tolerated. Oh, that's great. The, the only real problem, um, like I was saying before, is that you tend to also have escape, um, so other mutations develop. Not all across the board. People are happy on these for a while, um, but um, they do. Yeah, there is reports that there are people who don't respond, and they just have slightly different mutations, and they can escape. Um, the as as far as as targeting methylation, I agree 100. This is kind of like a global regulator. It's not like one single transcription factor or one funky um, tyrosine kinase that we can go after, and so that's why. Um, It'd be interesting to see. I mean, we really don't know that much about the TET proteins now uh, yet, but if there is in these type of mutations something that we could target particularly to spe specifically to that, um, it's harder. It's harder with um, TET2, which seems to be like the loss of it causing. It. It's harder to go after um, things like that with. It's easier when you're going after something that's mutated um, that, that you can actually target it and get rid of it. When this is, we lose it and we get the transformation, it's harder to kind of go after that global uh, thing with, with one thing in particular. So, yeah. It's really impressive in vitro and in vivo studies together. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's always a lot of, uh, a lot of teamwork. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about, so your mouse model is a complete loss of function, basically. Right. So it's interesting that the heterozygote showed, was it comparable levels of, yeah, so that's very interesting. So it's not acting as like a classic tumor suppressor where you'd, you'd need double loss of... No, and that's that's a lot of the work that we're doing, or the lab has been doing now, um, has been looking at that because we think it's secondary type of additional mutations that are, that the loss even of a single allele pre predisposes you for, but we don't, we don't know. Yeah, it's hard to look for where those mutations would yeah, fall. Since it's such a global effect, mm -hmm. like before, I mean, it's hard to know. We've done some um, microarray analysis and um, tried to pull out some things that, you know, do we have an increase in these type? And we do, we do have an increase of transcription factors that are associated with, you know, the differentiation to a myeloid mm -hmm. um, type of cell. But, um, but yeah, what, what's it, you know, driving that and things mm -hmm. like that besides methylation, you know. And are all, all the human, the mutations found in humans, they're all essentially loss of function? There's no, I mean, there's in this sense, um, but yeah, in, in general. Most of them are looking yeah. at. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? I just have a quick, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, it's no, okay. 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 Um, I, I, was curious why you started with TET2 because I show I remember you showing the three and I so I know sometimes the reason you start with one is because of nuances of something happening in the lab but when you show the the models of the domains of TET1, two, and three I feel yeah. like I remember TET2 was the one that maybe was missing a little something right. compared to one and three right we didn't we didn't know that at the time we started with TET2 because the patient data first okay. so it was really looking at patient data looking and then trying to go back and recapitulate that in vivo to see if it, what we saw in patients really was 
had a direct link to the phenotype that the patients were presenting with. So that's why it was started with TET2. Um, there, there has been some work, I mean, TET1 was actually identified because it was also associated with a translocation with TET, um, with a type of leukemia. But yeah, that was it. Just a very oh. quick, just for the kids. Um, how did you actually physically mutate the mice, just generally? Um, so we we yeah. so we took we took a construct um, a DNA construct and we um, it's it's a lot of work. You take you actually clone in your mutation um, and then you do um, homologous recombination and then you you have a, a neo cassette. Um, so you allow these um, the 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 DNA to recombine. Um, you transfect cells and then you select um, on a neomycin um, selection. Um, and then so anything that's integrated into the cells um, will survive that selection process. And you have to pick those. Um, then you go through a whole, um, you have to actually inject um, pseudo-pregnant, you know, you do in vitro fertilization, but with a mouse. <laughs> then, you, then you inject the mice so that they are pregnant or think they're pregnant, then you inject them with the, um, with the, the eggs and, um, and then you hope <laughs> that they survive and then you start crossing and then you cross and cross and cross. Um, yeah, so it takes, you even cross them with a flip deleter string first to get that neomycin cassette out because you don't want that to interfere with anything else. So it's a process, it takes it takes quite a long time. Yeah. So. Any other questions? Yeah. I was wondering in, uh, in patients, um, if anyone's ever looked at something like a vitamin B12 deficiency because we know that it has effects on certain forms of anemia, but it's also really important for sort of global methylation since it serves as an essential methyl donor. And there's been some suggestion that vitamin B deficiency would result in hypomethylation. So uh, that's an excellent point. I'm not aware. I know, uh, yeah, no, I have, I'm not aware of anybody looking at that, but that's a great, that's a great point. Uh, when we were doing this work, I actually, if you look at the, um, if you look at some of the tattoo figure, it's from an article that's from last year. So this work w was published in 2011. And so I actually was learning I mean, in preparation for this talk. I was like, oh, we know this now, you know, because I haven't been able to go back and look at it recently, so I'm not aware. But yeah, it's been changing, and the tets are really a hot topic right now. So yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.